Growing up, there was this TV show I used to watch that gave a glimpse into what the other side lived like. Now, I, I don't want to be poor math here and act like I grew up in poverty because I did not. We were middle class family, and I know that middle class family in America is like the wealthiest 1% of the world, okay? I understand that, but we also were not super wealthy. Like when we went to go buy clothes and shoes, we checked the prices. Y'all know what I'm talking about? We wanted to know how much stuff cost because there was a limit to what we could buy, but there was this TV show that offered insight into the way the other people got to live. And I just want you to, to watch this to see if it rings true to any of y'all, if y'all know what I'm talking about here. the globe to uncover the stories America will never stop talking about. She grew up only wanting to be a hairdresser, but Tammy Wynette styled herself a dream and took it all the way to Nashville and into the hearts of America. Visit the private paradise of Maui and join the fun as the superstars make waves at this jewel atop Hawaii. Meet David Brenner for a slice of the good life as the crazy comic puts fun on the menu during a high rollers tour of Atlantic City. All this and more when Lifestyles returns. Stay with us. Remember that? Lifestyles of the rich and famous. The kind of life you're never going to have. Come and watch. Come and see and taste for you're never really going to get to experience it. Yeah, I remember this show. Like, I remember watching the yachts and the private jets and those vacations they talked about where you can kind of see a glimpse of it, but no, you never get to go there for real. Like, I remember what it was like, and I just want to understand. I don't have any problem with any of that. Like, if you have money and you want to go do those, that's fine. Don't go in, like, crazy debt. Don't let, you know, your desires get a hold of you and take your passions from God into things of this world. But I have no problem with it, and if you do live that kind of life and you want to invite me to tackle, I'm fine with that. I'm fine with that. I don't mind at all, but whenever we talk about being rich, that's where our mind goes. We go to possessions. We go to trips, we go to things, we think of the cars that we don't have, the houses we don't live in, and the clothes that we can't afford to wear. I, I was reading this article where somebody spent $750 on a torn pair of jeans that looked like they got them out of the dumpster. Like, it's just money that gets spent that I don't understand. And as we enter into this series, I want you to understand what this is not. We are not talking about how if you believe more and if you give God more, then you can have the riches of this world. That is not what being rich and what matter, matters most talks about. Whenever we talk about being rich and what matters most, we're talking about being rich that doesn't look at your possessions, but you can think about what you have in your life and you want for nothing. If you have your Bible, I want you to turn to 2 Timothy chapter 2. We're going to be in verse 22. And what I want you to understand is kind of the setting in which this was written. There is a guy named Paul. And he went all over the world, and he won people for Christ all over the known world. And he had this disciple, this guy that he led to Christ, this guy that he had massive influence in, and then he left him where he found him. And Timothy was this guy's name. It was his disciple. He raised him and groomed him and trained him up in, in the, the faith, and he became a pastor, the leader of the church. And so you have these two letters, 1 Timothy, which was kind of how church and how life was supposed to operate as a leader within the church. And then you have 2 Timothy, which is basically Paul writing to Timothy to clarify a few things and to reassure him because Timothy was young. And one of the things that Paul told Timothy was, don't let anyone look down upon you because of your youth, because he'd been called of God with the purpose of God, and he was to live in the power of God. And so whenever you look at 2 Timothy, you talk about or you see how Paul is telling him to guard that which was entrusted to him, the deposit of faith, to live for Christ in new and fresh ways, how he was supposed to soldier on in the way of Christ, that he was to be a powerful representation of Jesus Christ that he was to be a workman approved by God who accurately handled the word of truth. And then as you get in this, he talks about how you're to live differently. And then in verse 22, he gives the so in this. Like he summarizes everything. And then in verse 22, he says, So flee youthful passions and pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace, along with those who call on the Lord from a pure heart. 
And as we look at this, as Paul is commanding and charging Timothy with this task, I believe that there are four characteristics that Paul gives Timothy that apply to our lives today and how we can live in the riches of God's glory, in the riches of God's goodness. So as we look at this, there are four ways that we are to live. And number one, we are to live in the right places. When he says, so flee, it is a clear call for him to flee the passions of his flesh. Now, Timothy lived in a day and age that is not too uncommon from what we live now. In fact, the day-to-day interactions of sin and temptation was greater than what we face today, except today we have it in the palm of our hand. In the palm of your hand, you can see and do pretty much anything you want. The evil that lies within your smartphone, if you go the wrong direction with it, is a great tool for good, it is a great tool for evil, is right there. But in Timothy's day, it was different. Timothy lived, whenever we talk about a pagan world, Timothy lived in a pagan world to where pagan practices were the daily norm. Like things were so evil in Timothy's day that as he walked the streets, there were all these pagan temples. There were these pagan prostitutes, male and female prostitutes that would walk the streets and basically on the bottom of their sandals as they walked, it was this clear indication that if they would follow them that they could go straight kind of inconspicuously into a pagan temple for prostitution to take place. You had these pagan worship, and they took pride, and they considered it a form of worship if they would engage in debauchery and drunkenness. If they would engage in all these sinful passions of their flesh, then automatically they would not be doing evil, but they would be worshiping these gods. Like, that's where Timothy lived. And in the midst of this, Paul looked at Timothy, and he said, so flee youthful passions and it's this clear indication that whenever you see evil you go the other way whenever you see something coming at you you don't go toe to toe with it but you avoid it and I believe this is a common misconception we have like the Bible tells us to flee the passions of the flesh but we have this misconception in our hearts and our lives that in order to be a strong Christian in order to be a courageous Christian in order to be a man or woman of God what we have to do is we have to come to a point in our lives to where we go toe to toe with the devil like we have this mentality in our brains that we see sin over there in order to be a strong Christian who's faithful, who, who loves God, that we got to be able to walk over there like we're big and we're bad and go toe-to-toe with the devil and say, I'm not going to fall for your temptation here. We think that in order to be strong, in order to be wise, that we go up to that line and we say, see, you ain't got nothing on me. We talk a little smack. We go, what, what you want some? I'm not going where you are because I'm a strong Christian. And I just want you to understand that if you approach this fight, if you bow up and you look at sin and you look at temptation, you think this is wise, you think this is strong, and you think this is where godliness lives, you are an idiot. You are living in foolishness, and you are living in the opposite of wisdom. In order to be a strong willful, intelligent, wise follower of Jesus. You see temptation and you go the other way. You move away from sin. You don't engage it. You don't see how strong you are. You don't see how much temptation you can endure. You don't see how much sin you can overcome. You flee from it. You flee from it and you pursue the righteousness of Christ. That is where strength is. That is where wisdom is. And what Paul is saying is, Timothy, if you want to be a man of God, if you want to live in the riches of God's goodness, you stay away from those things and you pursue after the righteousness of Christ. A lot of times, we find our place, ourselves in places where we need not be. Like, look, I know that there's like some drinking going on here, and I know that some people are doing some bad things. But it's not like I'm going to engage in it. You ever know anybody like that? People who tell you where they are, but they make excuses for it at the moment that they're describing the place where they find themselves. Where'd you go out? I just went out with the guys. I've learned that in order for us to 
unclarify or declutter or to clarify cluttered situations, we have to engage in asking ourselves questions like, is this a wise way to live? Is this a beneficial place for me to be? I've talked to mostly men about the struggles and temptations of certain restaurants and places and situations that they find themselves in. And I just have a, a, a question that you need to ask yourself whenever you're asking, am I living in the right place? This is where it lies with me. How would I feel if my daughter worked where I decided to eat? How would I feel if my baby girl, my daughter, was where I was going? Moms, how would you feel if where you went, your son's engaged in that same establishment? How would you feel if your son or daughter went to the same websites you went to? How would you feel if they engaged in the same places where you go? Because for me, that's a sober reminder that my actions matter. And more than my words, my actions pave a way that my children will follow. And Paul is quite clearly saying, you flee youthful passions and you do life in the right places. But not only that, he also says that we are to live with the right people. I love this verse. So flee youthful passions and pursue the righteousness of faith and love and peace along with those who call on the Lord from a pure heart. It's been my experience as I've lived my life that it is best for me to flee peers of immoral pleasure. I found that the people that I spend my time with have an ability to influence me. I find that if I'm doing right and I'm surrounding myself with people who are living right and making good decisions, I have a tendency to make good decisions. But in the times of my life, whenever I got with the wrong crowd who had no values, who did not share the same values, who did not same, the, share the same pursuits as me, my tendency and the likelihood for me to have regrettable actions raised significantly. And it's not always bad things where people influence us. Sometimes it's relatively harmless things. Some of you may or may not know about me. I think I'm to the point where I'm not going to do it anymore. But I love a, a spicy buffalo wing challenge. And to this date, in the handful of these things that I participated in, I've beat all of them. And some of you are like, yeah, but you haven't gone here. I'm going to take you there, and you're going to die, clown. I know, I know that's what you're thinking. There was this one time I had decided to go to this, I think it was called Wings to Go. And they had the suicide or homicide challenge, like the kind of thing where in the name you know better. But I was like, nah, I got this. And then a friend of mine was like, well, I could do it. And the group that we were with were like, no, you can't. There's no way you can do this. We believe in coal, but you, why don't you try it if you're so big and bad? And I went, and I did it, and I finished it. 30 wings in like 15 minutes. It was ridiculous. And I just want you to understand something. Whenever you're doing the wing challenge, there's a point to where the pain of the spice on your face isn't worse. Like the, the pain of trying to eat 30 of those things becomes worse than the spice. It's terrible. But my friend watched, and because I did it, he decided that he could do it. And my group of friends decided that they were going to goat him into this, that they were going to talk him into it. And here's the deal. If you finish, you don't have to pay for it. But if you, if you lose, you got to pay for all of it. It's like a $50 mill or something. It's ridiculous how much it cost. And he's like, oh, i got to do it. And he was cheap. He didn't like spending money or anything like that. And I'm just going to tell you, two wings in, he was done. He was crying. He was talking about how bad it hurt. And had he been alone, there was no way on earth he would have even attempted it. But because he surrounded himself by a group of people who kept pressuring him into doing it, 
in that moment, he had a regrettable action that he couldn't undo. He had to suffer for a few days. And if you think I'm kidding, just try it one time. Because peers influence us. The people that we are around have a tendency to drag us wherever they're going. There's a couple of passages that talk about how sin can influence us. In Genesis 4, 7, it says, Sin is crouching at the door, and its desire is contrary to you, but you must rule over it. It is this idea that sin is literally just waiting for you to crack the door open so it can pounce on you. Sin is crouching at your door, and its desire is for you. In the New Testament, there's another picture of sin. And it says this. It says in 1 Peter 5, 8, Be sober-minded, be watchful, your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. So when we're talking about doing life in the right places and doing life with the right people, we need to understand that sin is crouching down like a roaring lion just waiting for us to crack the door open so it can devour us. And some people have the notion that in order to be a strong Christian, in order to be a wise Christian, they've got to toe the line of sin and prove that they don't do it. I'm telling you, ignorance. Do life in the right places and do life with the right people. Because as you do, what you experience is, is the fullness of the riches of God's glory. I would encourage you to live your life among godly friends. If you're like, well, I don't have very many of those. There is a reason we have connect groups in this church. Our connect group, some of you might know it as Sunday school. We call it connect groups because we want the people in our church to connect with other people in the same age or life stage. We feel like that is the heartbeat of our church. If you're not connected, we want you to get connected because it is in your connect group that you share life with others. You build relationships. It's a whole point. It's a whole reason of why we have home groups. We have home groups tonight based out of our connect groups because we want people to build relationships outside of the walls of this church. That way when you're living and whenever you're struggling, whenever there's good times or bad times, you have somebody else to share your life with you because I promise you there will be a time when you need someone to pull you in God's direction. Because the world and the enemy will pull you away from God all the time, so you've got to have godly friends who pull you in God's direction. And I'm not saying it's bad to have friends that are not Christians, but I will tell you this. You don't have to live and immerse yourself in their culture and their way of living. You have a home base, a connecting point to where you are influenced by godly people so you can be an influencer for God himself as a representative of Jesus Christ, our great God and Savior. We want you to live your life on mission. We want you to go on mission. This summer, we have a family mission trip. June 9th and 10th, it's $50 per family. Somebody said, Cole, how do I pay for that? Well, you write a check, you put it in the, off the, the envelope, and you place it in there, and we're going to lose money on every family that goes, but we're going to make an investment on you to live your life as an influencer for Jesus Christ. You can build these relationships on mission for the glory of God. The whole reason we do this, this family thing, is because we want you to understand that Jesus calls you to be a difference maker. And if you are immersed in a culture, in a setting, with people who are not of God, you will never be a difference maker. It's different to live on mission and to reach the lost than it is to engage in their lifestyle and their way of being. So we want you to live your life with the right people. But not only that, as we look at this text, as we look at our passage, so flee youthful passions and pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace along with those who call on the name of the Lord from a pure heart. We want you to live with the right purity in mind. I love this idea of purity. In the Old Testament, it was a basic sense of being clean. 
It went along with the ritualistic way of living, that you did a certain thing so you could be accepted. But in the New Testament, it was changed. Because in order to be pure, according to the New Covenant, it's not so much about who you did, it's more about who you were in Christ, that you become set apart. See, a lot of times people think in order to be accepted by God, I have to ex- I've got to exit my way of living. I've got to exit the way of the world. But I'm telling you that Jesus receives you just the way you are. He transforms your life. And because of the transformation that takes place by the power of gospel, it is that power that is alive within you, the power of Jesus Christ living in your heart that transforms everything about you. And whenever you think about this, we must pursue the principles of Christ, the way that we're called to live Pursuing righteousness, faith, love, and peace in a Christian body. Whenever we look at this, 2 Chronicles 12, 14 says, And he did evil, for he did not seek, he did not set his heart to seek the Lord. I'm of the opinion that all of us will pursue after something. The passions of our flesh will point us into the direction of worldliness. The passions of our flesh will look for us to fill things up with the riches of this world. They're seemingly unattainable. And the more we have, the more we crave. But Jesus tells us in his word that we are to seek after the Lord and he will be fine be found so what I would challenge you with as we talk about living in right purity is to live armed with the word of God to dig into the word of God to dive into the word of God to study it to understand it to make it your own to see how God wants you to live as his follower to see the pursuits that Jesus wants you to to pursue after to fix your eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of your faith. And I just want you to understand something. There are lots of biblical teachers out there. There's lots of preachers who do not preach the word of God accurately. They get caught up in all these irreverent babble. They get caught up in this name it, claim it. And you'll hear certain things that if you just believe right, And if you just give God enough money, I promise you, you'll have everything in this world. You'll have all the prosperity that you want in this life. The more you give, the more you get from God. That's how it works. That's what they say. This jackpot Jesus. But whenever we are armed with the word of God, we see and understand what the word of God is teaching us and we grow in our wisdom and understanding and right believing leads to right living we try and help you with this as a church we offer our Wednesday night discipleship classes we have three classes going on right now our mentoring class study of Ephesians and how to share your faith and all of these classes take biblical principles and they apply them to our life and the whole point of this is for us to understand the word of God so that we can avoid and dodge the evils and pursue godliness So I would say get your Bible, dig in, and go deep. And as you dig deep, you will live with the right priorities. When you're living with the right priorities, everything about your life is transformed. There is a measure and a time in our hearts and our lives whenever we look and we experience what the world has to offer and we crave And our desires and our hearts is pursuing after these things. But as we know God and as our lives are transformed by God, everything changes. His desires become our desires. And we look at our Jesus who said that he came to seek and save that which is lost. And we look at our lives and we want to be representatives and ambassadors of the change that God has made in our hearts and our lives. We want to share that which makes us different. We want to tell people about the greatest thing that we've ever experienced. Not our car, not our house, not our job, not our power, not our position, but the position of being saved and transformed by the power of the gospel. There is this idea that instead of pursuing 
the passions of this world and the passions of our flesh, our flesh, we pursue the passions of Christ. And we get to a point to where instead of seeing what other people can do for us, we see what we can do for them and our entire worlds are transformed. Whenever I think about living with the right priorities, priorities, we look in our lives align with the Word of God and we become Jesus' representatives. The desires of God become the desires of us. The way Jesus lives transforms the way we live. And we live truly aware of the riches of God's goodness. You know, there seems to be this tragedy among us that people are mixed up in what's most important in life there's this natural void in their heart and their life and with it they try and fill it with stuff that's why you've got so many men and women just trying to find that one perfect soulmate so they can fill that void in their heart and their life and they go from person to person to person just hoping that they can realize that emptiness they feel in their heart and their life. That's why you got so many people in this world with the jobs that are good jobs, decent jobs that provide for their needs, but it's never enough because they can't get that thing in their life that's missing fixed. These people who have that dream car that they've always wanted for and as soon as they drive that car off the lot it just doesn't seem to satisfy them the way they thought it would they move into that house and when they put their head on their pillow they are confused because the house they always wanted doesn't seem to create peace and satisfaction in their heart and their life the way they thought it would See, the things of this world, the passions of our flesh are empty. And that void that you have in your heart and that void you have in your life is real. And if you keep trying to fill something up with nothing, you just remain hungry for truth. The Word of God tells us that He has put a desire within the heart of man for knowledge of the holy. That we were created for a relationship with God. The beginning of time when God made man. And we had this perfect relationship with God. There was harmony. There was significance. There was meaning. But the scripture tells us that man and their desire to be like God created rebellion against God and they ate from the tree of knowledge and evil. They ate that fruit and that created a void, a separation. And ever since then you see how people are trying to fill that void and fix that void. More times than not, it's all about the riches of this world. The Word of God tells us that while we were dead in our sin, and that was the result of eating the fruit of that tree, death, spiritual death, separation from God, that while we were dead in our transgressions, that Christ died for us. That even though the wages of sin was death, the gift of God was eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. And it gives us this picture of redemption. Because Jesus, he who knew no sin, became sin so that we could have righteousness with God. And if you can somehow relate to hoping that this position would fulfill you or hoping that that possession would fulfill you and you still feel empty, can I tell you how you feel that need and how you feel that void is not with things of this world, it is with the person of Jesus Christ who died on the cross for your sin. And you can seek and you can pursue after things of this world, but you will never fill that void with anything other than the person of Jesus Christ. And if there's never been a time in your life to where you put your faith and your trust in Jesus Christ, 
You need to understand the void, that hole in your heart, that hole in your soul that you fill will only be filled with Jesus. And as you look at what this world has to offer, you can pursue those or you can live in the riches of Christ Jesus. And the way that you receive it is by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. And as you think about the power and the will and the word of God in your life. I know that there are some people in here, you look at your life and you know that you have been in places you should not be with people you should not spend time with. And it is time for you to flee the way of living and pursue the way of Christ. Pursue the righteousness and the glory of Jesus Christ. And if you're in here and you need to make a change, and you need to transform your way of living, I just want to invite you in a few moments to pray where you are in your pew, or to come and pray at the altar and confess that to a God who loves you, who saved you, who redeemed you, and will receive you back just as you are. Perhaps you've been coming here week after week. Perhaps you know that there's a void in your life, and maybe what you need to do is just join our family maybe today is the day that you say I need to do life here and you need to buy into the vision that God has given First Baptist Relic however God is moving in your heart and your life we're going to give you an opportunity to respond I'm going to pray and then Tim and the praise team is going to lead us in a time of response And it is yours to do with what you choose. Dear Heavenly Father, we come before you today. Grateful that we can call you Father and know that you hear us and love us. Lord, I pray that if there's anybody in here that does not know Jesus as their personal Lord and Savior, that today they would turn from the way of this world and that they would turn to Christ. If there's anybody in here who identifies with Jesus, but for whatever reason they've been going wayward in their daily life Lord I just pray that you would call them back to yourself to the righteousness to the purity of Christ if there's anybody in here that needs to join our church today I pray that they would walk the aisle and link arms with us as we fulfill and seek to fulfill the vision you've given to us as a church in Jesus name we pray Amen